one of the greatest drummers in the metal scene today, the Atomic Clock, the human drum machine. Please welcome Gene Hoagland. Gene, how are you, man? I'm doing well, Ted. Good to see you, brother. Likewise, it's been since March since I've seen you. How how are you doing? I'm doing I'm doing really well. I'm doing great. Myself and Lara are doing really good. We're just I, I tell you one thing, since this whole lockdown pandemic thing hit, we're we're busier than ever. You know, like I'm wow. busier now than I ever am in like in between tours kind of thing. So it's been I've been a running fool for the last four months, five months, whatever it's been. So that's pretty good. Yeah, it is pretty good. It seems like I talked to a lot of people and they say the exact same thing you do. They've been busier now than they were when they were touring, you know? God, holy man. I remember that first the first month after we got back from the Bay Strikes back there, it was kind of like it. I put myself on like a two week quarantine just out of the gate. And the day that my little self quarantine ended was the day that California shut everything down. So I'm like, oh, man. So uh, I spent that first month or so just kind of twiddling my thumbs going, hmm, you know, because none of us were sure exactly what was going to be happening. And then the words started coming out like, man, stuff's getting shut down until 2021 kind of thing. So that's when I started thinking, hmm, what should I do? The first month I was noticing that quarantine lifestyle is pretty much no different than regular lifestyle. Cause I don't, I don't go do much, you know, all I do yeah. is head to the grocery store and that's about it, you know? And so nothing really changed for me. And then I decided, well, you got to do something. So I figured out some things to be doing. And now it's just been, go, 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 go. So, yeah, man. Yeah. I say, yeah, you? I mean, I, I, you know, when we got back from the base tracks back, you know, well, if you've heard the stories, we'll got sick, you know, the whole of deal, course, but I, I just quarantined myself too. And, you know, like the same thing. It's just, no different, really. I just yeah. stayed home and, you know, go to the grocery store, come back, you know, walk my dog and just kind of mellowed out. But I was able to do a lot of things that I don't normally get to do. Oh, when, that's nice. You know, like, you know how it is when you're on tour, you come home, you got two weeks before the next tour. Yeah, right. And you're like trying to rush, like, what can I get done? But, you know, the blessing of being, you know, locked down for, you know, is I was able to relax and get to do a lot of things I don't normally get to do. So that's, that's a blessing in itself. Well, that's one thing I think everybody, yourself, myself, I think that's one thing we did was we just tried to find the blessings in all this nonsense. You know, it's like, okay, well, new ideas get created, new, new, you know, just thoughts of, okay, how can I remain busy you know, keep everything just, you know, keep my chops up and all that stuff. So I'm fortunate that I have a jam space to come down to. Excuse me, you know, and I can, I can work out all my aggression, keep my chops up. And so that's, I'm very fortunate for that because, uh, you know, you talk to some people are like, I, I can't access my kit. I can't access my gear. So I'm just stuck doing this at home right now. So you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate in that regard. So, yeah. Yeah, man. yeah. Especially for a drummer. I mean, you have a jam space to go to and for us guitar players and instrument players, we could just jam out in our little homemade yeah. studio, which is a blessing too, you know? Absolutely. man. But before I, we, before we get into a good conversation, we've done quite a few tours together, Gene. Absolutely, I mean, brother. a lot, a lot of tours. And I, you know, I had we had some great hangs and great conversations. You know, it's Darn tootin', brother. we we always have fun, and I just have to show my fanboy moment here real quick. <laughs> I'm gonna talk about this album, Darkness wow. Descends. That's real and, fun. And you signed it for me. I want to tell. Oh, that's, not, that's real fun. I remember that. Yeah, and um, I want to I want to tell a story on how I discovered this record, and I was thinking about it this week. Um, it was, I was in eighth grade. It was on my birthday, December 19th. That's when we got out of school for Christmas break. And I went to a Catholic school. And for my birthday, my, grand, my grandfather gave me 20 bucks. And that's, you know, 20 bucks is a lot of money in 1986. Darn Absolutely. Yeah. And after school, I went to the, the record vault. You remember the record vault in San Francisco? Absolutely, man. Been yeah. there many times. 
Met, yeah, me too as well. I went to the record vault and with 20 bucks, I was able to buy, I bought DRI dealing with it on vinyl. And yeah. I bought and I bought the DRI shirt. And when I was in line, there was some dude in front of me, a metal dude, had a back, you know, denim and leather, had a patch. Yeah, man. And he was buying something. He was right in front of me. And I was looking at what he was buying. And he bought a record, a vinyl, and a demo tape. Two demo tapes. It was Betrayal. Remember Betrayal? Mmm, try to remember them. I remember from Fresno. Fresno. <laughs> okay, for, okay, they're from Fresno. And a, another demo tape, Evil Dead. Oh, darn tootin'. Hell yeah. I know yeah. I still have that demo. And and he had this with him. And I nice. looked at it and I was like, oh my God, that that album cover looks crazy. <laughs> and I look I looked over, you know, his arm and it said Dark Angel. And I said to myself, I gotta get that. So in the new year, as soon as I got enough money, I went back to the record vault and got Darkness Descends. And we have arrived. Oh, that's fun. Oh, awesome, man. So that's that's my uh that's how I discovered Dark Angel. And that's how I that's discovered badass, Green Hogan. Yeah. Oh, December awesome, 1986, man. dude, on my birthday. That's how I discovered it, man. Kick ass. Well, December 19th. I'm always gonna remember that one then. Yeah. And speaking of, your birthday's coming up Monday, right? Am I correct? That's right. Yeah. That's right. My... <laughs> so Gene. Not only, I mean, you play drum, but you also play guitar as well. That's right. And, you know, it's pretty fun. It's like I was, like I was telling you right before we started this wing gig, you know, I, I was playing some Death Angel on my, on my Twitch stream this week. I was cranking out some of the Ultraviolence record and I was jamming along to it. And I was telling my, 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 my Twitchers that, uh, that, you know, I used to, back when I was, like, even before I was in Dark Angel, I was learning how to play riffs, and I had the, like, the Kill is One demo and all that. Um, wow. You know, I was, I was teaching myself guitar to every thrash metal thing I could get my hands on, and, and of course, you know, the Bond of My Blood advance that came out for nine months before they released Bond of My Blood. I'd learned all that. I'd learned all the Slayer stuff. I'd learned Dark Angel stuff. I was playing tons of Death Angel. i I knew how to play a crap load of Death Angel riffs before I ever wrote a riff for Dark Angel. So I thought that was wow. Really that, that, that's I, weird. I know that we have a song on Time Does Not Heal called An Ancient Inherited Shame. And I know that, you know, Kill is One was probably a little bit of an influence on that. So uh, that's pretty fun. And like I said, you know, Death Angel's just gotten better and better and better over the years. You know, we Thanks. love the stuff and you guys are just killing it and you're putting out crushing album after crushing album so that's pretty fun thanks man same with you and testament i think you know not only us in testament and exodus that last tour proved like we're, we're still going and we're still putting out good stuff and we're still having a good time you know and that's the thing you know it's like that's why you know, and I, I always tell everybody death angel is got to be my favorite band to tour with because of you guys yourselves you know we love your music of course but, you know, it's because everybody in Death Angel is awesome. Like, Thank you. You guys are the coolest band ever to tour with, man. It's always a good hang. Everybody's always in a fun mood. You know, Mark, I've never seen that man ever down, you know? Like, God, that's really fun. So uh, you might. We don't, you know. <laughs> that, to himself. But, I mean, you know, you guys are always such a pleasure to be out with. You guys are our brothers for 30 years, most of you, you know? So, that's pretty cool. We, we love all that. Man. Right on. And, and the feeling is mutual. Now, I, you know, I had the pleasure of watching you on when we done tours together. I had the pleasure of watching you a lot of times every night. And, you know, our good friend and your drum tech, a shout out to Jeff Bruce. Um, yeah, he would let me come behind your kit and watch you. And what really tripped me out is you're ambidextrous, right? Ambidextrous, you could play like, and what tripped me out is like your drum set is set up right-handed and left-handed. Uh, yeah, a little bit. I, yeah, when I see you play, sometimes you lead with your right foot and yeah. you lead with your left foot. Now, is that something you learn or is that something that came natural? Like, oh, I could do this. Or is that something you went, I wanna try something. I wanna see if I could play both sides. I seriously, well, the, the whole reason why I play open-handed, you know, I play like that, 
is that is very simple. That's the way that um, that was where my record player was located when I was a kid. You know, like, but because my record player was on that side of my bed. You know, I had two sides of the bed there, so I would just hang my head, hang my feet over the side, and I'd play my bed. And if you ever notice, play the top corner the top right hand corner i guess of your bed you know the top corner is like doo, 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 and then you go boop, 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 boop. you know like the, the closer to the middle you get that's a little lower so i'm like well there's my record player you know change the records out every time i'm finish a side or whatever and so the the top corner of my bed was kind of a, a higher boop, 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 boop. and so i'm like well, i guess that's my snare so get the snare on that thing and then boop, 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 boop. i guess there's your kick drum so that just the, my record, if my record player had been played on the other side, I've been placed on the other side. I'd be playing as a right-handed, as a right-handed drummer. But since it was over there, so that started me with the open-handed bit. And the fact that I can play kick drums with either feet, kind of thing, I think that kind of came from necessity more than anything. It was like, oh crap, you know the the kick pedal broke on that side, and you're right in the middle of a set. So keep playing to switch it over to the right, and Fortunately, growing up playing thrash metal, most of your beats are pretty much bam, 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 bam on the kick drum. So it's pretty easy to just go bam, bam, bam with your left foot if something's going wrong over there. So and then I started playing a lot of unison kind of things. And so that is I guess that's probably an exercise that's really good to to be able to. OK, you can't use your right foot for whatever reason. There's a drumstick stuck in your in your pedal at bounced out and, oh god my right foot can't be used for a minute chef get this thing out of here switch over to the left foot and play with all that so i, I it, it was something that was kind of born from necessity more than anything that i was like oh let me work on this it was like yeah it's you know you go bap 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 with your right foot you go bap 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 with your left foot it's all the same thing to me you know so if i ever know that there's somebody standing behind me i'll i'll just goof and like play one do 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 kind of we have while playing thrash beats just to have them go what in the world is that dude doing so that's pretty fun yeah it, it, it is pretty fun i was like wow he's leading with his left foot right now and usually on that song he leads with his right you, you just i guess you just switch it up when you feel like it right like ah, i think i'll lead it lead left right now Sometimes, yeah, it's just it just depends on kind of what the part is calling for, too. So I guess, like, I do know one thing that, like, when I'm playing, like, a fast double bass, well, any sort of fast double bass, I'm a left foot lead. And that's merely because I'm a left-handed lead. And I, I just figured that you should probably be in unison up and down. You know, your left hand comes down with your left foot, right hand comes down with your right foot kind of thing. So just so you don't cross it up on the way to your brain kind of thing. You know, you just keep it all, you know, symmetrical, I suppose. So there you go. But that's pretty fun. Yeah, man. It's, it's, it's very trippy to see, but it's awesome. To see. <laughs> I, so, I mean, I, 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 I walk off like, Jesus, how does he do that? It, it, it's, it's awesome. Um, well, that's fun. Thanks, brother. Dark Angel, you were in Dark Angel, but Dark Angel, when Dark Angel broke up, was it 1992? I believe it was yes yeah, September twenty September fifth. I remember that because it was Freddie Mercury's birthday. Wow! One year anniversary of his passing. I remember on the day that Ron came to the studio and said, "Man, can't carry on anymore." And it's like, "Oh man!" So we just kind of never really broke up, but it was just we just kind of dissolved, I guess, more than anything. So there you go. Okay, but. You know, out of everyone, like the thrash scene was kind of dying out like 92, you know, around that time. But you were pretty fortunate because right after Dark Angel, you joined Death and Death, right. Metal, Death Metal was becoming really huge. Absolutely. So you were you were able to be able to like keep going in your playing and whatnot. Now, was Death and Dark Angel was 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 it did you have was it trying to learn a new style Cause to death? Well, uh, it was, I, I admit, it was rather a polar opposite, in, entirely polar opposite dis, uh, situation than Dark Angel because, like, with death, Chuck was writing all the music, all the lyrics. He was taking care of all the 
press and all that stuff, all the things that I would do with Dark Angel. So it did allow me to just, hey, you get to concentrate on being a drummer. You know, the man in charge has all the all the stuff taken care of over there. You don't have to do any of that. Um, so you get to really be. And I guess that's I suppose that's when I became a drummer was in death. And I, I do. I've, I've, I've mentioned this many times. It's like I remember hearing the human album with with the magnificent drumming of Mr. Sean Reiner. I remember hearing that at a at a metallic house party one night and somebody brought in the album and we're, you know, I'm sitting on a couch and there's another dude over in the other couch and the party's going on all around us, but we're just concentrating on this record because it's just, you know, human was such a destructive record. And I just remember turning to the dude after the last song, I remember turning to that dude, I don't even remember who it was. I was like, man, I'm glad I'll never play in this band. <laughs> <laughs> a year later, yeah, I'm playing all these songs with these guys. And so it was, playing that kind of style that where, where Chuck was very, he was very gracious in, in his musical approach. You know, he's like, man, I, you know, go sick, go nuts. Um, all the beats you're laying down. I can, I can play all my riffs over all of them. I like what you're doing. And he, since he already had had the, the busy creative style of, of Sean preceding me, um, I got to really take a lot of, a lot of really awesome influence from Sean in the fact that everything is like wide open now. All the approach of drums can be, you don't have to just fit it into the box of, you know, you know, simple double bass and all you could, you could do some really crazy patterns over the top and Chuck's like, yeah, man, I got you. You're good, man. Keep doing what you're doing. So it was a very easy transition because a lot of the ideas that I might have had for Dark Angel was by the time we got to Time Does Not Heal and what was going to be the next album, which was ironically called uh, The Atrocity Exhibition. Um, that's what we were going to title the next one. Um, I guess Gary Holt and I read the same book. <laughs> <It's all laughs> but um, the uh, I was so non-drummer by the time Time Does Not Heal came out and and then we were working on the next album i had like 10 or 15 songs written for what was going to be that next album and the drums the the it wasn't that the drums were taking a back seat it was just the guitar playing had stepped up so much that you know instead of being 50 50 you know half guitar half drums i was concentrating so much it was like 80 percent guitar yeah i just get some beats on there that are going to be cool they don't have to be all that creative just something that buttresses all your riffs so i wasn't as as uh motivated by playing these psychotic kind of beats or anything so after dark angel dissolved and then i was able to move move my creative head very nicely over to death it's like oh you know you can just you can hear you know just kind of channel the beats like chuck sent me this adorable riff tape which was, it was adorable. You know, it was like ghetto blaster recording, ghetto blaster, you know, play into one ghetto blaster, then push play on that and play into the, play your harmonies into the other ghetto blaster, then bounce that down together and send it off to Gene. I just thought that was adorable. We all had four tracks at the time, you know, but Chuck was doing it super old school, you know. And by the time I had gotten that, you know, the little demo from him and was putting my, my, my brain to work with, you know, hey, you've got Sean as an influence. That's all of Sean's style of drumming is definitely on the table now. So, Gene, you get to really, you know, you don't have to do the kind of leprosy, spiritual healing approach of drums. You get to have human as a gigantic influence. So there you go there. So that's that was how I was able to uh, uh, seamlessly transition, I suppose, over to death because I got to put a lot of my fusion chops you know the prog rock chops that i i had a lot that i had a lot of but couldn't really pigeonhole or shove those into dark angel songs but now with death it's like dude all you have to do is drums so go nuts and so it was just a green light all around to come up with what we did for 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 individual and then symbolic you know expand upon that a couple of years later so that's pretty cool wow wow that's 
Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, just by listening to that, because you've done a lot with Dark Angel. You wrote lyrics, you write music, and when you joined Death, you were able to just be a drummer. Was that also a transition, like letting go some of the range, like I don't have to do this, or I wish I'd done more writing for Death, or was it like, okay, I'm just switching it up, I'll just play drums and just not even play guitar or contribute any ideas or riffs? Well, you know, I guess that... Um... I do remember that when the, the the day that I showed up in Florida and Chuck picked me up from the airport, we went out to we went out to grab a bite to eat, and over the dinner I was telling him that you know I noticed on that adorable riff tape, you know, I went into individual thinking that wow, me and Chuck are gonna just write this monstrous death metal album, and it's gonna be so ball crushing and it's gonna be amazing. Um, that was before I'd heard the riff tape that he was preparing to send me. So I had it in my own brain what it was going to be like, just all crushing. And plus, he had Human right behind him. That was a really aggressive record. Um, I was thinking it was just going to be, it's on. You know, we're going to write this death metal classic. And when Chuck and I were having, you know, I'd already, he'd already sent me the demo and I was listening to, the, to that little demo and I was like, ooh, this is not brutal or visceral or really anything this is very melodic all the riffs were like super up high you know on the high e's and the a's and stuff like that and i was like man oh man that's this is not what i was expecting i mean it's all really cool stuff so when i i had mentioned to chuck at the dinner i was like you know one thing that would help me on the drums is if we sat down together with guitars and I learned all the riffs because then I'll catch all the little nuances of every single riff, certain things I might be missing off the riff tape that you sent. So let's sit down with guitars and then we'll figure it out from there. And as we were jamming out and he's showing me all the riffs really up here, I was like, hey, Chuck, you ever thought about like taking some of these riffs up here and go like down here, get a little chunky and heavy with them? He's like, oh, I, I never thought of that, but Hey, that sounds pretty cool down there. I like that. I, I wrote it up here. That's the only way that I heard it. But now that I'm hearing it down here, I, I'm cool with that. So fortunately, we were able to take, you know, transpose some of the riffs from way up high down to low. And that is kind of the extent of my guitar playing with death, kind of, you know, like my guitar playing in an official capacity for, for a couple of years. And well, we, we did do a cover of uh, Exorcist. I possess yes for the individual record and I remember Chuck was like I don't have time to learn it at the moment but Gene if you'll just lay down the guitars for it you know do the drums lay down the guitars um I'll, I'll learn it and then yeah, we'll, we'll keep it as a b-side I love that song I'm excited to learn it and then they just never got to the point of learning it which you know what recording's like you know you got yeah this many ideas and then you got to pare everything down to like there by the time the, you know the deadline is approaching and all that stuff so uh they never got to it but however i did notice that it got re-released on one of the re-releases of individual thought patterns and that's me on guitar me and stevie wow. D playing it so on drums and guitar so that's pretty fun so that was the final capacity of any sort of guitar playing that i had with with death and and by the time we got to symbolic i think chuck was really in his you know he was on the on the path that he was that was working the best for him you know and he was letting he definitely let us know that his his interest in death metal at the moment was not quite what it was you know seven eight years ago when he was a younger dude and i'm like i get that we all evolved and you know so chuck you know, he was he was never real comfortable with the with that title of you know the Godfather of death metal. He was like, I you know he had just he was always trying to pay it forward to the guys that did precede him. He's like, hey man, there was possessed, there was even merciful fate in terms of some of just the darker imagery and things like that. I'm not, I didn't create this, uh, but when it was time for Chuck to start moving into the the areas that he was feeling comfortable with at the time which was i think something a little more melodic obviously is something a little more traditional traditionally metallic sounding um i think he had to really follow his follow his groove with that and so he did and so that's why like symbolic even was 
a, it was very traditional metal record, you know, it's very listenable today, you know, and I think that's one of the reasons why Symbolic has, you know, stuck around a little bit because it's not just a, you know, just a barrage of just brutality. It's like, wow, there's actually some musicality and some melody behind this. And so it's one thing if Chuck helped create and define, you know, visceral, brutal death metal, he then was a big part of the technical side of metal, you know, like the atheist kind or Watchtower-esque style of technical metal. Definitely deaf human. That was a progenitor of that style. And then Chuck helped create melodic death metal. So, I mean, the man was ever evolving. And so that's that's one thing that was very cool. It's one thing to create, help create one genre, but then to help create another genre and then another one after that. So that, that's pretty cool. So that's pretty pretty awesome of death you know exactly and speaking of technical because you know death you know with individual and symbolic there's some technical stuff and you happen to do a tour of, with stevie d and craig le cicero was on the death Aren't tour you? with you yeah and man, brother craig. yeah and speaking of technical i guess did chuck sought out craig because of forbidden because yes. forbidden were the technical metal in the bay area out of That's all the bands they were they were like the tech gurus. I can, I can see that. That's like forbidden. I, I must, I, you know, love the old Exodus, bonded by blood, love all the Death Angel, love all the stuff coming out of the Bay Area. But forbidden is flat out, flat out my favorite of all the Bay bands. You know, I mean, bonded by blood. That's good. Blah, blah, you know, number, number classic, you know, number of course, one of course. for me anyway. And then everything that Forbidden ever did was awesome. And for me, for my personal opinion, each album got better and better. You know, Forbidden Evil, then Twisted, then Distortion was amazing. I love Distortion. And then Green came out, yeah, and Alpha Omega, um, Omega Wave, I mean, you know, all of that. Was, they just kept raising the bar. So, but yeah, Chuck, you know, Chuck loved Craig and you know, we're all friends. I think. I would imagine that maybe Chuck and Craig met at that uh, Ultimate Revenge 2 gig that we all did. I think that was Forbidden's very first East Coast show because we, we filmed that Ultimate Revenge. It was for the, I don't know if you remember, the VHS that came yes, out. Yes, I do. It was with Dark Angel, Death, Faith or Fear and Forbidden. Am and also Raven. Raven. But Raven was filmed Raven. separately. Uh, no, heard. they were filmed at the same night. You okay. know, I do remember they used the crowd shots from the earlier bands when they <laughs> was on stage. I remember that. I was like, hey, wait a minute, did they use that for, you know, I remember seeing it later. But uh, yeah, that was that was an amazing gig. Got to meet Forbidden that, that, that weekend. And that was awesome. And Craig and I have been lifelong bros ever since, man. He's my absolute brother, man. Totally. I'm, I, you know, Dominic calls me Uncle Gene. So, nice. Dominic, so that's cool. Um, and uh chuck was a huge forbidden fan you know he loved craig he loved russ you know chuck was super into the melodic side of vocals and um and so i remember when we were we had ralph santala you know i mean death was ralph's initiation into death metal because ralph was not a death metaler at all when but he was one of the local hot shots of the Orlando area for for guitar wise for for Chuck so Chuck had to find somebody and Chuck had had a about two or three year search in the Orlando area for Bobby Coble who eventually joined us on Symbolic but he was telling me before individual thought patterns he's like there's a guy in town named Bobby and this was pre-internet, so it's not like you could get on Facebook and find him. Hey, Bobby, would you like to come play with that? You know, so he's trying to find people's phone numbers that had Bobby's number. And so he couldn't get Bobby in time for anything at that time. So he had Ralph. And then Ralph was, he's like, I can't do that European tour because my band back home, we got some stuff coming on. So it was just a natural, when we were in the Bay Area, you know, Chuck just turned to Craig. I, I believe it was like that. And just, said, hey, you know, you want to come help us out with this? And it was great. It was a great lineup, man. It was so fun. We did the, we did a European ladder two months of 1993 uh, European tour with Craig as our other guitarist. So 
that's pretty cool, man. And and so and Craig and I have been definitely brothers since that period, absolutely. Yeah, man. I, I remember that lineup, especially I haven't seen it, but I, I remember it was just for just that tour. And speaking right. of, you were living in the Bay Area what, during death. Am I correct? Let me see. During death, I was living in England, but I was spending a lot of time. Like it was definitely after, after I, like when Craig came and did the stuff with us, I was living in England at the time. So uh, okay. it, it was just an easier thing to, to you know, uh, it was easy to live in England because the flight over to Florida was real easy. But I remember we did rehearse in the Bay Area or because we had two Bay Area guys. So I came all the way over to the Bay Area to do the jamming with with Craig and Stevie D and Chuck. And then, yeah, we turned right back around and flew back to Europe right after that. But uh, that was that was super cool, man. Yeah, I was I, I was spending a lot of time in the Bay Area, um, but I was, you know, mainly I, I, I suppose out sur surfing with friends, you know, and then when I did the uh, the demonic record with Testament, that was another kind of couch surf situation i was staying with glenn alvalize for a while then i'm staying with eric ramirez who evolved into testament's basis for that record so you know just some couch surfing but i spent you know nine months at a time on, on people's couches so I, I could see where it it was the assumption i was living there but you know I, just, I suppose i was if you're living on a couch that means you're living there so yeah there you go because i did remember seeing you at quite a few bay area shows in the nine right. like 90s and speaking of, I was hanging out with uh, Will Carroll the other day, and he knew I'm, I'm going to speak to you today. And he goes, "See if see if uh, Gene would remember this." And I, and he says, "Do you remember Toe Tums?" Toe Tums? Wow, boy! I was doing a lot of drinking back then, so I'm not Toe Tum. No, I don't. I do he not. says he says that was your old phone number when you were living on the Lower Hay. That's how you remembered your phone number. It's spelled oh, that's out. Oh, fun. <laughs> Two tongues. Oh, that's hilarious, man. Oh, goes, I, I got that just bounced out of the old brain there, but that's fun. Toe tongues. Now it's starting. To yeah, toe out. tongues. Yes. Yeah, so awesome. Now, you you done a stint with death, and would the next band, I believe, would be Strapping Young Lad after death? That's right, yeah. Now, how did you get involved with Strapping Young Lad? How, how, um, did you audition for them, or did they seek you seek you out? Because you're you, you're a drummer that nowadays everyone's seeking out to you know like. We oh, should that's get fun. <laughs> well, it was. Let me see what happened. Um, I, Devin and myself, we had a mutual friend, and it was a friend of mine named Craig McDonald who used to work for KNAC Radio. You might remember them. And they, I still they still have an online presence, I would imagine. But Craig was one of the on air you know personalities sort of thing, and. Craig was always telling me, man, you got to come meet my friend Devin. You know, my friend Devin's in town. He's writing some record. And, and you know, he just did a clinic over at MIT or MI, Musicians Institute. And it was great, man. You got to meet this guy. He's super fun. I was like, okay, one of these days. And I remember Iron Maiden and Fear Factory were on tour together in 90, 96. And that was Iron Maiden's Blaze Bailey period. Okay. And it was Fear Factory's like kind of demanufacture period. So, you know, Fear Factory was on the way up. And yep. um, and Iron Maiden was, I saw them at the Palace in in L.A. And that's a 1,500-seat venue, you know? And it's kind of like, whoa. And um, but my friend Craig had called me and said, my friend Devin's going to be there. You know, let me introduce you guys. And maybe you guys can do some jamming together or something like that. And so... Yeah. Met Dev that night and we put together, you know, Dev was like, yeah, man, I'd, I'd love to jam with you. I'm doing this record. I got this band called Strapping Young Lad and, and we're about to do our second record. And and so Devin and I got together a few days later and did our first jam. And he gave me a cassette of, he had all the songs programmed on drums. He was a great drum programmer. So it was really easy to learn the material and kind of genize it a little bit. But that began a relationship that lasted for about a dozen years of working together and stuff. And so that ended up with me, you know, transplanting myself to Vancouver, Canada. And I lived there for a dozen years while I was doing a ton of Devin stuff, strapping, Devin solo stuff. I had a billion local acts, you know, like Zimmer's Hole and things like yes, that. Yes, I remember Zimmer's Hole. 
darn tooting and a bunch of my kick-ass bands there were when i moved to vancouver there was such a vibrant amazing never heard anywhere else kind of metal scene i was like why is this this is the best metal scene i've seen in any of the towns i've lived in oakland's and and because by the time i was doing oakland in 95 96 you know thrash metal kind of you know yep. that was not quite what it was six seven years earlier kind of thing so you know just seeing the vancouver metal scene bands like you know punch drunk and bomb scare and subversion and bands that i you know i was part of punch drunk that was a bunch of kick-ass bands as well as strapping as well as zimmer's hole i was like this scene is amazing i want to move here and help raise this scene up a little bit and you know there was a lot of foot shooting happening that that you know during all that period but you know hey we got strapping on the on the on the grid we got some zimmer's hole on the grid out of it anyway so that's that's pretty fun wow that's fucking amazing gene i'm gonna i want to get to a couple of fan questions here you want to uh, let's check it out here we go hey what's up gene what's up ted this is jesse here huge fan of both you guys i hope you're staying safe out there and i uh, hope to see you back on the road someday um my question today is for Gene. Gene, I know you're a huge uh, fan of Rush and Neil Peart in particular. And I was just curious what your favorite Rush song is to play. Uh, Follow-up question. Do you have any advice for a beginning drummer on mastering stick control? I know that you are one of the best in the business at that. Uh, so I'm curious uh, how you developed it. All right. Take care, guys. All righty. Well, Jesse, that's a great question. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm absolutely a gigantic Rush fan, and it would be rather challenging to pare down my favorite tune to play. But let me see. I would say side one of Hemispheres, that entire side one is one of my favorites. And, and of course, the mighty YYZ, of course, songs like Natural Science, that one's a great one to play. And, you know, even even... Like, I wish I could pull a song like different strings off, you know, because that's some of the drumming in that song. It's just so beautiful. It's so tasty. And that tiny little hi-hat that he got, my big old drumsticks, I couldn't play a hi-hat that pretty if my life depended on it. But uh, um, yeah, boy, any, you know, any pre-1982 era drums would be, <laughs> that'd be great. It's like, working man. That's the best song ever for Rush. I love playing that one. You know, the John Rutsey version. That'd be fun. But uh, as for uh, stick control, the only thing I would probably, um, I guess, you know, stress or something is just try to keep the sticks rather supple. Try not to grip it like a baseball bat. You know, just try to like, God, I wish I had some sticks here. I got some sticks right over there. But uh, um like try not to grip the sticks too hard. Just kind of keep them kind of light in your hands. Like this is about what my hands look like when I'm when I got sticks. Just imagine a drumstick coming here. I think this is about my fulcrum point. I believe that's what it's called. That's about the only spot right there is where I hold the stick. You know, kind of similar to something like that. It's not. It's not like that. It's just kind of like that. And the let you let your entire everything here be the mechanism that works that stick rather than it just being your wrists or your arms you kind of get your use of everything going here when you're when you're playing and you keep your sticks real supple i do i do move my sticks up and down a lot as i play like my hands are constant this is my hands are constantly doing this as i'm playing you know that's that's i'm playing guitar on the stick i'm I'm playing the beep, beep. sounds like one of those beep, beep, one of those things, but I that's kind of what my fingers are always doing when I'm playing, and I keep the stick super. My sticks are moving up and down. Like if this part coming up calls for like the stick to be like, just I'm grabbing the very butt end of the stick for this just part coming in the song. Beep, 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 you know, move it down there, and then oh, you gotta like kind of choke it up a little bit because here comes that fast part. You kind of do that a little bit. And so that's why the sticks are constantly moving in my hand. So I would suggest keep them rather 
loose in your hands. And that's that way you can get this entire thing working for you. If you notice, I don't use a lot of arm when I play, you know, most of it's, you know, I have this, I guess, economy of motion. And that's because, you know, this is all doing stuff. You know, that's kind of my, my hands are like two little spiders on the sticks. So there you go. Hopefully that helped, Jesse. Wow, man. That's that's a pretty technique there, Gene Hogan. <laughs> yeah. oh, my word. Hit, hit. We'll do another fan question real quick. And I, there's a few things I really want to talk to you about. So cool, check man. This out. Hey, what's up, Ted? What's up, Gene? This is Ted Vardell, also known as Teddy Vardell. Uh, know, Teddy Denver, Vardell. Colorado, formerly of San Diego, California. And I've been a huge Death Angel fan since 1987 and a huge fan of yours, Mr. Aguilar, since joining in 2004. And Gene Hoagland happens to be one of my ultimate drumming heroes ever since I listened to Side 2 on Combat Records. Uh, with the opening track, Death is Certain, Life is Not, where Gene came out with this insane double bass. And the very next song, Black Prophecies, that Gene penned himself. It's one of my uh, top 10 favorite metal songs of all time and uh, perfect cool. for 2020. But my question is real quickly to you, Gene, sir. I know you're extremely busy well, with Testament right now, but for us old school uh, Darkness Descends, uh, fans of Dark Angel, will there be a Dark Angel album at some point? Thank you, sir. Well, I happen to actually sort of kind of know Teddy Bardell. His brother was Touchdown Tommy Bardell. You ever, you ever familiar? You familiar with much football there, Ted? I'm sorry. I just I don't follow sports, but you know I, I like it when my I like it when my friends do. Yeah, yeah, boy, living in the Bay Area, I know you got a lot of friends, probably. Giants, A's, Niners, Raiders, yeah, Warriors, yeah, all that. Um, well, yeah, his brother was touchdown Tommy Bardell. I know if Craig's watching, he'll be like, I will know who Tommy Bardell was. But yeah. um, and I know I've I've known Teddy through the band Newcomb, who who Lara jams with and stuff. So, uh, but that's really cool. Well, Teddy, we are we are you know attempting to write another Dark Angel record. I admit my creativity for it the last couple of years. There's been a few ancillary things going on outside of the music business for me that just tapped a lot of my creativity toward this. I know I came out of the gate just running like, oh yeah, man, we're gonna get some chick ass Dark Angel record out. Then a bunch of things happen outside the music biz that just sapped any sort of time creativity like the time that i had allotted to spend on like hey i'm gonna be home for two months here kind of thing i'm gonna write the hell out of dark angel stuff no i had to take that two months and you know or giant chunks and deal with some stuff that happened outside the, the biz for me and so i admit that really just wiped out my creativity and just you know put me in a state where i'm like oh god jesus and so but I know we are still attempting and, and I admit that since this lockdown happened, you know, I haven't been able to get up to LA. I've not left, I've not done one thing outside of come to this studio and go to Trader Joe's, you know, like that is it. I have not traveled up to LA to get with Jim Durkin, who is, uh, you know, a legendary creator of Dark Angel, who's back in the fold now. You know, we did a few, we did, we did, time does not heal without Jim but um you know it's just we've always found that we work best together when we're just face to face we both have guitars and then we bought ourselves a little electronic kit so we'll write some riffs I'll jump on the kit real quick drop, drop on some beats and then you know track over that and when Jim you know over the last you know 20 five god over 30 years 31 years since jim originally left the band jim went and got himself a really beautiful career so between his schedule my schedule um you know it's it has been a challenge but i'm hoping for the best and we're working towards it teddy man good to see you my friend yeah man uh, yeah Fuck yeah, I can't wait for the new Dark Angel. When it comes out, Gene, when it comes yeah, out. Yeah, we're, we're working on it, boy, I tell you. One thing I want to get into, and, you know, there's been a, a fan question here from Kathleen McCarthy. Remember, she asked about the time you filled in for Charlie, and I also filled in for Scotty in on that tour, remember? Me and you That's played it. Right. We, got, we got to play it. 
Anthrax for what a couple of shows? Yeah, it might have been one or two. Yeah, it might have been a couple there, man. I remember that first one was at Indianapolis. Yes, I remember that, and it, it was April funny because I, me, and Rob Cavastani had to learn the songs like the night before. I mean, it was right, like we that's were when fit- Scott went to the hospital. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That was, that was unexpected, absolutely. And we were trying to figure it out, but you have a way of just. This is what I want to ask you. Like, you have this memory. Me and Rob were trying to figure it out, but it seems like up there to listen to the tune once and you got it. <laughs> if it were only that easy. But uh, for, for me on that tour, I, I think our first show was on a Thursday night. And I remember it was Charlie had asked me on the Monday when we were in Anaheim. I think he asked me on the very first show, which was Monday, um, if I could do it. And I was like, yeah, sure. So I, uh, what I did is I filmed Charlie. I just sat behind Charlie, filmed uh-huh. the Monday night show, filmed the Tuesday night show or whatever, Sunday night, Monday night. And then I think we had to travel out to wherever, you know, Indianapolis or whatever. I know we, we got that little rehearsal place, but I was fortunate That's that right. I had a little little demos you know i had little videos to watch to, to kind of because that was the thing when charlie asked if i could do it i was like of, of course man of, of course and, you know say no more absolutely man i want to i want to help this out because you know he he had mentioned that like if 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 you can't all of our guys that that we reach out to in this situation they're all like busy right now this is last minute you know because remember he was having you know he's having some family stuff happen at home and um, he's like, if, 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 if you can't do it, that means we have to pretty much pull out of the tour. And then the tour, I think, is probably going to be over. And I was like, well, you got 35 people on this tour that we can't be having that. You know, we can't be sending everybody home. So, of course, I'm in. So, um, I, but the one thing that I thought of was, it's like, okay, well, Gene, you could just you know, lay in your bunk and listen to the album versions of all the things. But I do know I've seen Anthrax enough times that they've changed arrangements and they do this when they used to do that. And, you know, the arrangements evolve over the 30 years. So I thought, well, I, I, in order for the other four guys in the band to be comfortable, I decided to learn Charlie's present, you know, present maneuvers, you know, his, his, his approach. And so I learned all of his licks and I learned all of his, all the, you know, when this part used to be a thrashing part, now they half time it. You know, I, I kind of learned all that stuff just so the, oh, your dog's doing fun stuff in the back, kicking himself. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kicking himself. Um, no, and so it was, I was, I did that for, for the other four guys. So it's like, okay, it's a seamless transition. You know, we don't have to be like, oh man, what? Oh, oh, we're playing the album version. We haven't played the album version in, you know, 20 years. What am I, you know, it's like confusion all around for everybody. So I thought, well, just learn what Charlie did. So I was fortunate. I had little demos, you know, visual demos to, to get me through. I, it wasn't hoisted on me the night before like it was with you and Rob there, Ted. So yeah, I mean, you guys were champs, man. But, you know, coming right in because it was that night before, you know, yeah. it was... And- we didn't sound check with the band. I don't think we sound check with the band at all. We just had to yeah, sure. figure it out. So that I got to play in Anthrax for a bit for a couple of shows, and I got to, I got to jam with Gene Hoagland. So that was a oh, good thing. That's, well, I got to jam with Ted Ted Aguilar, yeah. and that was yeah. I could play my first Anthrax shows with you. That's yeah, awesome. that was awesome. So um, I got I got another video question in uh, Gene. So let's uh, let's let's get right to it. Here we go. Oh, fun. Name this song. Hey guys, back member Scott from Dallas here. Just wanted to know uh, when, during this time of COVID, uh, what hobbies have you gotten into that you haven't been able to do in the past? Thanks a bunch. Hobbies? What in the yeah. world is a hobby? Jeez. <laughs> My, a hobby I'd like to take up is kicking back on the couch for for an afternoon that'd be that'd be a hobby i'm down for um i agree well, I tell you, hobby. you know what i i have been able to squeeze in a tiny amount of video gaming here and there okay. you know like that's that's pretty fun i on my ps4 which i remember when lara got me the ps4 i was kind of like 
when are you ever going to get time to ever play this thing? And I, I downloaded uh, uh, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, you know, the game from 15, 16 years ago. You know, they, yeah. they have it on the PlayStation Store. So it was like nine bucks or something like that. So I downloaded so I, I'm slowly, tinily working my way through that one. That's that's pretty fun. And that would be the closest thing to a hobby. But I most of my my free time these days is, you know, pretty much I, I'm always involved in whatever the next project is. And I've got a gigantic project coming up. I start tracking some drums for it in a couple of months. And so it's it started off being around a 30 song album and now it's been pared down to about 20 songs but working my way through that and damn there is some psychotic drumming on on this this project and i haven't been able to uh disclose who it's for and who it's with but it is going to have a cavalcade of metallic monsters on it you know a lot of a lot of real big names from the metal and rock genres and it's it's gonna it's gonna have a very large spotlight when it gets released i would imagine it probably won't be released until you know perhaps this time next year if not a little bit later but gonna get some get some drums track on this thing in the next couple of months so i have about a month and a half to prepare for it and i've been preparing for this thing since december of 2019 so now wow. I'm, now and the songs have of course been evolving in their demo phases so i've tried not to get too like oh my god you're changing this arrangement now you know i've been trying not to get like that even though i really you know i'm, I'm into all the material that that i'm hearing um but i've also had to kind of not spend too much time with it because it is going to evolve and so you don't want to get so invested in this arrangement or these parts that might not be there when you track this so don't get too into that so it's been a kind of an interesting balance of getting to know the material but not falling so hard for versions that are from let's say march 2020 you know because by the time october of 2020 comes along those songs might be 180 degrees different and sure enough that's kind of what's happening here so so i've got a month and a half essentially to buckle down and get all this done and and i guess my other hobby has been twitch you know and that's that's become more than a hobby for 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 me because you know a lot of us are like you know like dad you're doing the you know you, you got your action going in the in the in the lockdown era that we're currently a part of but you know i had to figure out something to to i knew that i was going to be down here at the space rehearsing quite a bit keeping my chops up and so i thought well hell you know why not just kind of activate a twitch account and kind of have everybody be sort of a fly on the wall to your rehearsings and there are some days on twitch where where I'll be like, hey guys, I am just rehearsing today. You're not going to be hearing me playing any tracks, but I am going to be playing parts to, you know, I'm working on stuff. So that's kind of fun, I hope, for people. And, and my, 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 my stream has been ever evolving and growing. And my little, I got the, the amazing Atomic Cult community. I got some real awesome folks on the chat, on the chat board, and everybody's super sweet to each other. And I've I promote a lot of, um, I try not to make it corny, but I try to, you know, who doesn't like positivity? You know, like I agree. I've, I've had a pretty blessed life. I've had a pretty, uh, I'm very fortunate to have the kind of life that I do. And so I just try to, I guess, br bring the enthusiasm that I have for, for life and try to spread that out for folks. And hopefully people take it. It's just kind of like a, a two hour comedy routine with some, some some drumming thrown in every once in a while you know, every once in a while you know gotcha yeah i mean i i don't have any hobbies but i would say i i picked up better habits which you know ever Fair since enough. lockdown I, i've been exercising a lot i've been trying to eat well i've been yeah, you know man. walking the dog and you know i've been doing a lot of you know doing a lot of yard work and garden i got a tomato garden so that's a lot oh, of nice. like 
zen. I like to zen out and try not to have a, yeah, a lot of stress, you know, in your life, Absolutely. which is going to be a segue into my next conversation with you. We've had this discussion on the road where, I mean, you live the rock and roll lifestyle, Gene, but you, you, you gotten clean. And you also told me, if you don't mind me saying, you were once a diabetic, but you got that reverse. I mean, oh, I, yeah, like to, absolutely. I, I, I like to touch upon that because in this time of, in this era now, it's, I think it's important to promote health and for people, for everyone, not only just I us, agree, man. for our, for everyone in the world. Could you touch upon that real quick? Yeah, man. Um, well, I guess it, it was when I was doing the fear factory stuff, um, I had, you know, I had been a diabetic for probably about a dozen years, 15 years before that. And when I, um, I got back from a fear factory tour of Brazil and Lara was always so patient. Like she's a super, super duper health nut. Um, and she was always really patient with me, but I came back from this South American tour and I had ballooned up to 410 pounds in the two weeks that we had spent down there. I left at about 390. And then, you know, I put on another 20 pounds going to the Brazilian meat pits that you do. You guys know about those. So, oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, man. The two Hoscarias, boy, that was a nightly, daily occurrence for us. So I just ballooned up and I had gone to the doctor and he had told me that uh, he's like, hey, man, I just want to let you know that your numbers are really out of control. So, unless you, unless you make some, you know, pretty hearty changes to your lifestyle, you are going to, we're going to have to have you start jabbing insulin. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm, I ain't doing that. I came home and mentioned all this, you know, scenario to Lara and Lara was like, all right, F this. I've been patient with you for a couple of years, but now it's this dire I'm going to put you on a plan. You're going to listen to me. And in within, I'm going to, we're going to cure you of diabetes within three to six months. You're not going to have diabetes and you're going to lose a lot of weight due to what I'm about to put you on. So I was like, okay, I'm good with that. anything to keep from jabbing. And I went into it kicking and screaming and stuff. And she was super patient and just, you know, she's an amazing like guide for, 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 you know, in general for me. And so that was, that was the, the, the on the outset, I guess, or what an onset or whatever of, of a new regimen for me. And so I try to stick with it and I gave up drinking and, and you know, I was, I was never a really big harsh drug doer, you know, little end of the night, little something, something to go to sleep with, man, that's a little nice, but, uh, um, and so as of now, I have lost almost 180 pounds like since wow. since we've been home i've like we spent the first month just like not knowing what we were doing and then after about you know about april ish or so i'm like you know what you're here you're down there jamming every day why not just carry that through and build up your 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 health regimen and and things like that so um, I've lost 38 pounds since the last time you saw me, Ed. So, uh, wow. that's pretty good. I'm, I'm Gene Slimmons now. So <laughs> <laughs> I weigh, I weigh less than I, I, I weigh the same weight. I'm at the same weight that I was when I was 15 years old. So, wow. and you know, some of the chats that you and I have had over the years, you know, I've, I might've mentioned like, Hey man, I'm 52, but I feel like I'm 27. Like I feel better than I ever have. And I definitely, I, I, when I, when I met Lara, I remember telling her, it's like, oh, I'll probably be around for another 10, 15 years or so. And then I'll probably be out. And she's like, what? You know, like you really, you're giving yourself. Until you're about 55 years old to be on this earth, man. Don't be stupid, dude. You know? And so I've, I've learned to embrace that. And so with, I've taken that one step further. And now that, I've, I've mentioned over the years how I intend to be doing this, you know, hard, brutal thrash metal drumming into my 70s. And now I'm starting to really put the steps in place so that I will be doing this in my 70s, you know, easy, easy. And not just 
like from a, oh, that's adorable. He's still playing at 73 years old, 72, whatever. No, I'm going to be bringing it, you know, like just vicious double bass and, and keep trying to set the bar super high 20 years from now, even. So I figured I could like back when I was, when, you know, the last time you saw me, I was around 268 pounds, 269, right around there. And that was like super slim for me. I was like, yeah, look at me. Um, and so I figured, well, Hoagland, you've been, you've been bragging about how you're, you, this is your intent when you're in your seventies to be like 72 and cut and ripped and six pack underneath this party ball is going to be showing itself. And because I figured I could get away with this carriage that I have, I'm 6'4", 268 at that time. But I was like, if you're intending on doing this deep, deep, deep into your latter years, you better get ready for it. You better prepare for it. You better get, you know, like whatever you can get away with this size that you're at right now. That's okay. But who knows 20 years from now, if you can still get away with being this size and trying to do this. So you better start, you know, getting yourself into that position to where all this bragging that you're doing in 2017, 2018, that in, you know, 2037, you better be bringing what you talked about 20 years ago. You better be doing it like, like a champion. So that's kind of where I've, where I've been at, you know, getting super duper healthy and it's so easy, you know, like I got, I got my birthday coming up on Monday. And of course you always have some fun on your birthday. And yeah. Lara's having to talk me into having some fun, you know, cause I'm like, you know, she's like, what do you want for your, you know, let's try to, you know, let's order something from a really kick-ass restaurant and have it delivered or whatever. And I'm like, oh, we eat salads every night. I'm, I'm okay with the salad. She's like, come on, do something fun. I was like, well, I'll, I'll cook some chicken. You know, I said, that's, that's going to be my blow it meal is that I'm going to cook myself some chicken thighs, you know, Good. Yeah. but I'm going to cook 40 of them. You know, we're going to eat a lot of chicken, but still kind of maintain a little bit of healthy, but I know they're making me a, my favorite dessert. So I was joking with my Twitch stream yesterday was my last one until after my birthday. I was like, I got to weigh 232. By the time I see you guys on Tuesday, I promise I'm going to weigh 300 pounds. And <laughs> now I figure I'll put, I'll put on five pounds this weekend real easy. And then I'll just drop it next week. So, but it is, you know, as, as time does, does, does advance on us, we can either be really intelligent and take advantage of this current time. And well, at least, at least for those of us who do have the time to, focus on some things you know we all focus on music we all focus on on our careers but the addition of the uber focusing on health for me is something that's working out really well for me and it only improves the drumming and it improves your whole just just you know outlook on everything so i'm in a pretty fortunate position that i i, I can focus on these things you know i'm i'm, I'm given the opportunity to to focus on on health and and maintaining and not only maintaining but you know stepping up the game that's what i intend to do you know when we all get given the the green light to go out and do this thing again i'm going to be hitting it just mm, hard and so that's another thing that i'm doing is i'm starting to focus now on well hoagland when you know you do all this great stuff when you're at home you know eating the salads eat you know working out going to the gym all that stuff you can't go to the gym anymore, but you know, now I'm doing like yoga and I got my little weights at home and things like that. Um, but my biggest challenge is being on the road, you know, exactly. it's like exactly drugs were never my vice. Booze were never my vice. I enjoyed, you know, I, I enjoyed booze when I was drinking it, but I, it was pretty easy to give up booze. Food was, has always been my drug. So that's going to be the biggest challenge that I'm prepping for and I'm needing to really get my discipline together for the next time I'm on the road. You know, it's like, yeah, you can stop off and eat that cookie at 2 a.m. or drink some water and go to bed, Hoagland. You know, so I'm yeah. trying to place that discipline in my mind now for, for you know, because it would be, um, I always put on seven pounds or so on the road. You get this great cardio workout 
every night and then you blow it every night because of course ed you know the after show meal is usually yeah. pizza you know a burger a donair a you know a gyro whatever um and you know you, i'm never hungry when i get off the road uh, off off the off stage uh oh telling me my internet connection is unstable Ooh, that's internet okay gods. okay all right we're buffered but uh, i'm going to have to agree it it's it's hard to find good food on the road when you're used to eating good at home but the discipline yeah. is and you got to put the mentality is having to go out and search for the good food you know that's, that's instead of instead of falling prey of oh yeah there's some truck stop nachos i could eat at two in the morning oh, uh, how absolutely. about i don't how about i just don't do that and eat what i bought from whole foods that's on the bus you know yes precisely so. dad absolutely man yeah fully so that's the thing that's why i'm like i'm really concentrating that's like going on the road super easy for all of us it's what we do but going on the road with that proper, you know, discipline in place, that's going to be a fresh approach for me. So I'm going to do my best, God dang it, to really stick with, with, with that discipline. So we'll see how it goes, you know, because that's what I'm saying. You get this great cardio workout every night and then you can, you can lock it in by just, you know, being mellow after the show, not, eating the pizza or eating the burger or the, yeah, the truck stop nachos kind of thing. Um, drink some water and eat some walnuts, dude. You're going to be fine. You know, that's one thing I've always hated being hungry. And yeah, you know, it's like, it's okay. It's okay to be hungry. You know, it's okay to go to bed hungry. It's going to, you know, what's more important to you, your health, getting a little slimmer on the road or truck stop nachos at 3 a.m. sort of thing you know i i agree with you and the way i look at it now being at home gives me the opportunity oh, to try. Got crazy connection here no, no, i can no. i can still oh, hear yes. you and hear you, you my man you but, froze up there for me for a moment okay but you know being home on this lockdown this pandemic i i, I my perspective is health is wealth where yeah man you know in order my view of it in order to beat the COVID is to be as healthy as you can. You know, I mean, if I'm going to write, if I do get COVID knock on wood, which I, you know, don't want to, and I don't want anyone to, I, I'd rather write, I'd rather write it out at home than in the hospital. So the healthier you are, the better chances of you beating it. And, and your story is inspiring. When you told me that you had diabetes and you reversed it and you got healthy, it, it goes to show that there is hope for reversing that terrible disease. You know, it's insane. I dig it. Oh, gee. Ooh, yeah. yeah, baby. There, you, there you go. You were, you know what? Okay. I, I, I know that, uh, you know, I'm in my rehearsal space. My brother-in-law is right across the way there and he's a drum teacher and I can tell he has started a Skype lesson for himself or something. Because right. it's like internet connection is unstable. And then 30 seconds later, there's drumming going. It's like, yeah. but hey, man, we're we're doing pretty good. Yeah, we are. I, I got a couple of things before uh, yeah, man. We, we end our fun conversation. I mean, we didn't touch upon all the bands you played with. But out of every single band that you jammed with, filled in with, whatever, excluding dark angel because i know dark angel's your baby what's the one band you wish like man i wish it was still around going that we could be jamming and touring still well i i i've never made any bones about loving strapping young lad that's been my all-time favorite totally and i also love my other band from vancouver the almighty punch drunk and my other band from vancouver mechanism um you know both both bands were just amazing in their own ways and you can't really find any punch drunk on Spotify or iTunes, but you can find their album on YouTube. And I've actually reached out to a couple of the other members of punch drunk. We got some, some COVID quarantine punch drunk jams coming for the, for the Dean channel. That'll be fun. It's right just on. absolutely fun. So it, you know, and punch drunk was deadly, like deadly metal, man. That was awesome. So, if anybody's sitting around YouTube, go check out Punch Almighty Punch Drunk music for them asses. 
really fun. Devin produced that album and, and, and that, and then, you know, Mechanism was another one. And, you know, we are very fortunate. Stevie D, Bobby Coble, and myself, we love jamming together. And we're fortunate that we get to go out and do Death to All because we love Death's right. music. We love jamming with each other. We love each other. We love our each other's company kind of thing. Stevie D's one of my best pals for the last 30 years, you know, himself. And Bobby Coble is amazing. And our our new youngin, Max Phelps, he's awesome too. So the death to all thing is really fun. So I'm, I'm in a very fortunate position that some of these bands that I get to, that I've gotten to play with, I still kind of get to play with now. And that's one thing about like, like with Twitch, like I'm playing Strapping Young Lad songs on Twitch that I thought, wow, you'll, you'll never play these things ever again outside of like a clinic or something like that. But now I get to have my own little strapping jams. I'll put together a strapping playlist or a death clock playlist. Death Clock is the other band that I love to have more things happening, just like st cool stuff. So strapping, Death Clock, um, you know, it, it, I, but I still get to get my strapping yayas out now due to Twitch. My Death Clock yayas out due to Twitch. I'll put together little playlists of, you know, today's going to be a, a, a Death Clock day. Today's going to be a strapping day. And I'll take requests like yesterday, for instance, was an all day or all request testament day, you oh. know, because man, I know about 50 testament tunes. So, you know, I got my 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 cult, my atomic cult, just hey, dude, play God Face God. Sure, man. You know, play World War Three off uh, Titans of Creation. Sure, man. You know, so that's pretty fun. So I'm I'm fortunate in that regard, but yeah, strapping. And I a few years back I was given the wonderful, amazing opportunity to jam one show with Merv. Oh, yes. You know, you always remember Merv. They're one of yeah. my all-time, all-time favorite bands. They even let me make the set list. So I was like, how do, you know, they got like a seven-song set for the gig that we played. I'm like, how do you get seven dudes? These guys have 30 amazing songs. How do I cut that down to seven? So, uh, but that was super fun. I would do that in a moment. I love Jeff Bones, you know, they're, they're drummer for many years. And so getting to play some of his material with Merv, that was super exciting. So I'd do another Merv thing any night. I'd do another Kehoe Nation anything. Oh, I love Brian night. Kehoe. Kehoe's awesome. Yeah, who He's awesome. doesn't He's love Kehoe? He's one of the most funnest men in this entire industry. Everybody loves Kehoe, man. I love Kehoe to death and I love making music with man he is such a musical musical mastermind absolutely you know so that's always a pleasure too so and anything that gets me back up to the bay area i'm always down for totally. yeah totally gene thank you very much for joining on sat joining me on saturday and just having a great conversation it's really good to see you actually virtually see you and talk to you and if you want I'm going to give you the floor if you want to let everyone out there know what you're up to. Your Twitch, your website, the floor is yours, my man. Sure, man. Ooh. Did we oh, well, that's very sweet, Ted. Well, hey, yeah. everybody, if you, guys, if you guys got some free time this week or any week, really, I've been doing this roughly five, four to five days a week. I've got my little Twitch. Uh, you know, my channel, The Atomic Cult, which is super fun. I got a really fun channel. I do a lot of drum jamming on it. And I suppose you could probably find it by going to twitch.tv slash Gene Hoagland. That's how you find the channel. And if you want to become part of the part of the cult and drop some chats up, I, I pay attention to everybody. I make a lot of buddies through through this. And I believe you might have to sign up for it, but you know you still step in, check it out. That's that's always usually pretty fun, and it's in the latter afternoons on a weekday basis, kind of like somewhere between 4 p.m. and 5:30 p.m. West Coast time. We start it, so if you got nothing else going on, you know, spend spend a couple hours. I just have a really good time with it. We have a we have a very inclusive chat 
club of folks that everybody is super sweet to it, each other. I'm pretty insistent upon it. I'm like, everybody, everybody love everybody. That's the way I kind of put it out towards everybody. Everybody be super positive and just support each other. We are all equals. Absolutely. I just happen to be the dude in front of the camera. But you guys are just as important to this stream as, as the guy in front of the camera. So that's the way I view it. And we're building a really sweet, awesome community of some really, really cool people of you know, just real supportive, real nice. So if you stop in and drop a little comment, somebody's going to go, hi, welcome, you know, kind of thing. So that's pretty cool. So that's that's what's happening there. And I know that um, I'm, we are going to have a few more videos getting thrown up from, you know, on, on the Dean Hoagland official YouTube channel. So, you know, keep your eyes open in that regard. There's going to be some more death to all playing death tributes to Chuck. There's going to be a few of those and some almighty punch drunk. And I got another one coming up with, you know, playing some Slayer with a couple of dudes that do this on the reg. So you'll recognize a few of the names involved in the Slayer tune and stuff like that. So that's pretty fun. So, yeah, man. Oh, Gene. Well, I'm on, you know, I, I, I registered for Twitch, so I'm going to have to go check oh, it out fun. myself. And oh, you know, yeah, may brother. maybe maybe I'll try to throw out a song, see if you could play it right on the spot next time. You're Dude, you name it, brother. I will. I will give it a crack. Absolutely. <laughs> Gene, thank you again for coming on. And, you know, I'm sure everyone who logged on my I call, my my people, the community, the alive and streamers. I, yeah, I, check out, I, I check out all the comments afterwards and I'm sure they're stoked. I'm stoked that you're here, but stick around after the chat. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit. And, uh, I want to thank everyone for sticking around and watching alive and streamers, uh, the people who watch the show regularly and the newcomers. Thank you very much. And please give a round of applause for the atomic guy, the human drum machine, the Tom clock, Gene Hoagland, Gene Hoagland. Thank you again. Ah, uh, Ted Lee, it's always great talking with you, brother.